It's a real pleasure to be able to uh, share and come on the stage after Superintendent Torlakson. I uh, really admire your leadership. Um, and then starting with that, you're the, you're the star that starts this conference off, and then you're getting to uh, end this conference with Sir Ken Robinson. It's quite a bookend there. Uh, quite an amazing job that you guys have all done in putting this together. So it's just really an honor for me uh, to be a part of it. And I'm a California resident. I think a lot of people think I live on an airplane. but. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, am from uh, San Mateo, I uh, work in Mountain View, and uh, it's just a real delight for me to be able to be a part of the uh, transformation and learning that I know is going to come about in California. California has led so many parts, obviously, of transformation, not just in this country, but in this world. And uh, I really feel a part of it right now that the, the energy that's building from districts, from counties, from other education leaders around the uh, around the state right now is actually going to amount to some amazing things in the years ahead. So even as we're facing difficult times, I've never been more optimistic about what's ahead for the state. And that's sort of where I thought I would uh, jump in right now on the, on the conversation, which was to talk a little bit about this book, Disrupting Class, which a lot of my middle school teachers thought was my autobiography. <laughs> but I assure you it's not, um, for the most part. So the, uh, and, and when we approached this book and thought about the future of learning and what might be coming down the, uh, coming down the pipeline, I wrote it with a uh, professor at Harvard Business School, Clayton Christensen, who's the father of this body of theory known as disruptive innovation. And so as many of you know, I'm sure, we came at this topic of how do we help our public schools change and transform and innovate from a very different perspective, which was rather than being experts in education, we brought this body of work, this body of theory that helps make innovation far more predictable and successful, and basically applied it to education, put it on like a set of lenses and said, if we can understand some of the problems that our schools are facing, how might we use these theories of innovation to help suggest some ways for them to innovate and improve and solve these problems? And so what I thought I would do today since the theme of the conference has uh, tones of leadership, the future of education moving into the 21st century and really driving uh, forward for students, what I thought I would do is actually just take you through a few of these theories to begin with um, and apply them totally outside of education. So you'll have to bear with me for the first part of the speech as I just sort of give you some frameworks to think about these problems because what's emerged consistently in all of our research is that our theories tend not to give answers. Because as you all know, there is no one-size-fits-all answer for what ails us. But instead, what we hope is that they give you ways of thinking about it, language to talk about it with your teams, to go back and tackle really hard problems in different ways. And then through that, you can innovate to solve these problems. So what I'll first do is talk you through a couple of the theories that I think are pretty important in that regard. And then I'll shift and I'll talk about some of the things that we've seen that we think it implies for education, as well as uh, some of the things that we think um, uh, we're, we're seeing develop since the book has come out. And we'll talk about blended learning and some of the opportunities unique to California and so forth. And we'll go down that road. So that's sort of the roadmap for the speech. And I'll dive um, right in. When uh, Professor Christensen uh, entered academia, he brought with him a couple of interesting questions. The first question he brought with him was, why do successful organizations fail? Why do successful organizations fail? And if you think about it, it's actually a pretty interesting question, right? Because why bad organizations with bad people or bad processes, why they fail, that would be fairly obvious, right? But why successful ones with great people great ways of doing things, great meeting locations in Monterey, why those would fail is a lot less obvious, right? And yet, if you think about it through the sweep of history, what we see consistently is that the organizations that were at the top, a generation or two later, seem to be in the middle of the pack or even the bottom of the heap, right? There's been an article in Business recently that just came out that said of the Fortune 500 companies, like 97% of them will be off that list in the next 20 years. Right? And if you think about actually the rise and fall of nations, there's a reason it's called the rise and fall of nations. Right? 
So we see this consistently through sector after sector. And the question was, why does this happen? And as he studied the problem, we've just reached this counterintuitive conclusion, which I don't think will be very counterintuitive here, which was it's actually the very uh, principles of good management taught at places like Harvard that, while helpful to organizations on the way up, ultimately spell every organization's demise. So you, you mentioned I was a graduate of Harvard Business School. The other way to tell my biography is I spent a few years with Dr. Christensen afterwards so I could unlearn everything I had learned there and come to you in that spirit. The, um, and so what I thought I, and what came out of this work to explain this counterintuitive thing has been known as the theory of disruptive innovation, which has obviously played a critical part in Silicon Valley and, 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 and so forth. Um, and the rise of a lot of the technology companies uh, in, in California. Now, hopefully the slides are working. Seem to be on the wrong presentation. Can we, uh, can I just get a quick? You know what, I can fast forward it to the right one. There we go, okay. There's a couple extra slides inserted there. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, the, uh, what I've done up here on the uh, slide here is plot on the y-axis performance, and it's over time on the x-axis. And basically, you can think about this as representing any market, any sector, any field, okay? And what we see in every sector is that there are two trajectories. The first one is this relatively flat line. It's the pace of performance that people, users, customers, whatever, can utilize or absorb over time. And the reason it's relatively flat is our basic lives don't actually change that much from day to day, right? So the problems that you had to solve yesterday were something like those that you'll have to solve today, something like the things you'll have to get done tomorrow, right? Now, of course, there's a range. We're not all created equal. So there's some people at the low end who are satisfied with very little in the way of performance. And there's some people at the high end who we all have the misfortune of working with uh, who are never satisfied. <laughs> no matter how much you give them. Um, but basically, we've got these trajectories in our lives that are relatively stable. Now, the other line is the really interesting one. It's the pace of technological progress. And what it says is that technology always gets its start out there on the left-hand side as not good enough for the majority of users in a field. But what happens is that technology improves much faster than do our lives change. So what at one point is not good enough for the majority of users in a field, over time packs in more and more performance functions, features, such that it actually greatly overserves what the majority of us need out of a given application. I'll give you a quick example. How many of you remember the early personal computers in the early 1980s? Be honest, be honest. All right. So. Uh, you remember those personal computers, you'd stroll up and uh, you'd, you'd do some word processing on them, right? And you'd be clacking away. And every once in a while, you'd have to stop, right? And coax that stupid thing to catch up with your fingers. Because the basic Intel microprocessor inside those early machines, the 286, wasn't even good enough for a basic application like word processing. But what happens is that that microprocessor improved year over year over year. Intel marched straight up that blue line to introduce more and more innovations and so forth, such that today they're introducing Pentium multi-core, I don't know what, processors that greatly overserve the majority of people, I'd guess, in this room. There's people at Caltech and places like that who are demanding more performance. But for the most part, most of us have actually been overshot with what they can provide. Now, sometimes that march of that blue line are just these small year-to-year -year incremental improvements. Other times, they're giant breakthrough leaps forward. And most people have thought about the breakthroughs as opposed to the incremental improvements as different kind of innovations. But what we noticed was that they were actually the same because they sustained that blue line to allow the products at the beginning of that blue line to become better to serve more demanding users, and often to make more money. Not always, but often to make more money. And what we noticed was that, therefore, they were the same type of innovation in terms of its effect on the sector. And we called it a sustaining innovation. And what we noticed was in incumbents, the leading organizations in that blue line, nearly always won battles of sustaining innovation and were almost always the leaders at the end of that blue line. 
Now, what I've done is sort of push that diagram into that back plane here, and I promise I'll, I'll put some meat around it in a second. But the products or services in that back plane where things typically get started tend to be complicated, expensive, inaccessible, very centralized, and therefore they're only able to serve a limited few. There's a whole bunch of people that don't have the expertise or wealth and would love access to those things, but they just can't afford it or can't get access to it and whatnot. We call them non-consumers. And every once in a while, another kind of innovation comes on the scene. And we gave this one a horrible term. We called it a disruptive innovation. Terribly misleading. I call it that because it kind of sounds like the breakthrough leap forward, right? Yet, it's not at all what we meant by the term. And especially, as you know, when it comes to education, disruption is just a horrible uh, phrase. Unfortunate, you might say. But what we meant by it was something very specific. We meant by it something that came out that was not as good as those backplane products or services as judged by the historical measures of performance, but it redefined performance around something around affordability, simplicity, convenience, accessibility, and therefore it could serve those non-consumers and it would plant itself outside of that plane and true to form, the disruptive innovation would get better and better and better and better and better and start to be able to do those complicated things you previously had to do in the back plane and one by one would get sucked out into the front plane and that's how we saw transformation, that's how we see transformation occur in sector after sector after sector. And historically, what we noticed was that entrance nearly always won battles of disruptive innovation. Historically speaking, for some reason, it would always trip up the leading organizations. And a story that emerged out of Massachusetts, where I used to live, um, really helped to solidify this. If, if you went back to the 1970s and 80s, how many people remember Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC? Fewer hands than the ones that remember the personal computer. So DEC was sort of the leading company of that era. Um, it was kind of the Google, or actually Facebook, I should say. They're about to go public and raise all of our housing prices. But um, f right, it was sort of the Facebook of that era. High flying, everyone admired them. They made these product called mini computers. For those of you that remember mini computers, they weren't particularly small. They're about the size of this podium here. Um, but they were smaller than mainframes that filled an entire room. And, and DEC, um, whenever you'd read about why these guys were so good, they would say the th same thing, these journal articles and so forth. They'd say, not only do they have the uh, best uh, engineers in the world, they also have the best leaders, the best managers. And the implication was, if you guys were just as smart as they were, you too could be great and fantastic and so forth and you would be awesome, uh, but you don't. So DEC is a great company. Um, but an interesting thing happened to DEC in 1989. This leading mini computer business, right? Just best in the world. Within a six month time period, the business literally collapsed, fell off a cliff really rapidly. For those of you who remember it, some of you may have even worked for DEC and I should be careful, but just literally fell off a cliff really rapidly. And so you'd go back to Business Week or, and so forth and say, what happened to these guys? And they came back with the same answer every time, which was those stupid leaders, stupid managers running the company. If only they had seen the personal computer coming, they could have caught the wave, transformed the world, but they missed it. So they're going to be consigned to the ashtray of history. The problem, so, so this was actually the same time, 1989, that Clayton Christensen entered academia. So he also brought with him the question, why do smart managers decide to become stupid? <laughs> because it was the very same people running the company. Very same people. And they had been, you know, we had attributed success to them as smart, and now we were saying that they had failed because they were stupid. That's sort of what we do in every sector. But it just didn't make any sense, because why would smart people decide to do that? And not only that, every single mini computer business collapsed in unison. It wasn't just Digital Equipment Corporation. For those of you that remember, it was Prime, Wang, Data General, Hewlett Packard, every single one collapsed. And while you would expect companies to collude on price occasionally, to collude, to collapse, was a total stretch of the imagination. And yet it's, what exa it's exactly what happened. So something more fundamental had to be going on. And if you dug back into the story, indeed it was. You went back, 
to the 1980s, what you saw was that management was basically seeing two kinds of business plans come to them. The first kind said you build these unbelievably big machines right now, do demanding calculations for very demanding corporate and university customers and so forth. And um, it's a pretty good business. You charge a quarter million dollars on them, get 45% gross margins. We've been doing what the whiz kids at the Harvard Business School tell us to do. That is, listen to our best customers. And gosh, they said if you'd build a, build a next generation mini computer with even more functionality and speed and so forth, they'd be delighted to give you half a million dollars and we can make 60% gross margins. Another group came to them and said, you guys just don't get it, do you? If you just get up out of your seats every once in a while and look outside the window and it was not a view like this, um, you'd see that there's this thing coming called the personal computer. And I'm telling you, it's going to change the world. So now, to be fair to management, they got up out of their seats, they saw the personal computer, they even built four of them, I believe. Um, but they saw a few other things. First, the personal computer as it existed at that time in the early 1980s was barely good enough for word processing, right? Couldn't do near the demanding computations and calculations that the mini computer could do. So they would take this thing that looked kind of inferior, they'd bring it to their customers and say, hey, look what we built for you, will you buy one? They'd say, not a chance, that's a crummy device, we want to build another mini computer. And then they looked at the business plans and saw that they could only charge a couple thousand dollars on them uh, and it was 40% gross margins uh, in the good years, quickly going to collapse to 20%. So the decision management, in essence, faced was this. Should we build better products for our best customers for better profits, or should we build worse products that our customers can't use and won't buy for profits that would kill our business model? What should we do? And, but, but to be fair, right, it's a true innovator's dilemma. This is the innovator's dilemma. Because the very logical thing is to go up market, build bigger and better. And yet, if you don't somehow figure out to do the thing that doesn't look as good, quote unquote, it's gonna change the world underneath you and you'll be disrupted. And that's exactly what happened. They did the very logical, smart management thing. It's actually a story of smart management. And underneath them came this company called Apple that sold the first personal computer as a toy to hobbyists and children who couldn't afford a quarter million dollar machine, so this was not an inferior product for them. It was way better than the alternative, nothing at all. They could do computing now, right? Got its, uh, it started there and got better and better and better. And by 1989, could do a lot of those demanding things that you all had to go back to mini computer centers and mainframe centers for. And the volume just rushed out into the green plane there, and the world was transformed. And it was great news for all of us, with the exception of DEC. And this is how this process has played out. If you actually look, what I've done here um, is list in the blue column the companies whose stock we wish we had owned over the last couple of decades. I didn't own any of them. Um, and they've been disruptive to those companies in the red who in their own right were disruptive in their own time, right? Um, and you can just go one by one and see that this phenomenon plays out in sector after sector after sector. For-profit, not-for-profit, regulated, unregulated, you, you name it, you can see it. Um, you can take the top one there, the automotive industry. There's been rampant disruption, right? Um, Toyota and the Japanese automakers disrupted uh, Detroit and, the, and Ford and GM and so forth over the last several decades. Story's pretty well known. Question is, how did Toyota get its start? They didn't come in at the high end with the high-flying Lexuses that I'm sure all of you drove into the, uh, into the facility this, more, uh, this afternoon. But instead, they got their start with this um, low-end car uh, called a Corona. Anyone own a Corona before I make fun of it? <laughs> Be honest. All right. Um, so the Corona was this small car. It rusted really quickly. It wasn't very good. But they had this insight, which was let's sell it um, to non-consumers, people who can't afford the gas-guzzling cars that Detroit was shoving down people's throats. And so they started there, and then they went up market from the Corona to the Tercel, the Corolla, the Camry, the Avalon, the Forerunner, and then the Lexus, and changed the world. Now, to be fair to the managers at Ford and GM, they saw these guys coming, and every once in a while they said, you know, we really ought to go down in the low end there and compete with those buggers. 
And so they'd send down a Pinto or a Chevette. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when they compared the margins of selling one of those vehicles with the unmitigated blessing of being able to push out yet another Cadillac, Escalade, or Ford Explorer, it just didn't make any sense, right? So they'd retreat back up market, seed more ground, and by the time the story was really over, you knew what, you know what happened. So what's interesting is now Toyota has been being disrupted over the last several years. They didn't feel it initially because they had the privilege of stealing market share at the high end um, for Mercedes-Benz and, and, and so forth. But uh, recently they accelerated into the future, so it became more um, obvious what was going on. But does anyone know who's been disrupting Toyota? Just call it out if you do. Hyundai. Kia, Hyundai, yeah, the Koreans, right? Pretty, pretty dramatically so. Um, Actually, this is a commercial that Hyundai is running right now. It says, isn't it time someone did to Lexus what Lexus did to Mercedes? <laughs> they own the subcompact end of the market. They own the compact end of the market. If you notice, they're moving into the sedans and the full size and now the luxury segment. They're winning all the quality awards. Ten years ago, we all made fun of it, right? Uh, now they're winning all the quality awards. You see the story coming. Underneath them are the Chinese and Cherry. And, you know, the Indians in Tata with their cute little Tata Nano, I'm sure that'll never be good enough. But you see the story playing itself out. Uh, department stores used to be 300 plus department store chains, uh, full service, right? Um, were disrupted by discount retail. Kmart, Walmart, Target. Target, if you've noticed carefully, has gone up market and transformed itself into Target. Yeah. And, um, and now underneath them is online retail. Amazon and so forth. <clears throat> Interesting fact, Target.com run by Amazon. Um, true story. So you can see it in education too. I'm not sure you'd call community colleges quite a disruption to state universities, but it definitely decentralized, extended access to far more Americans than could be accommodated by the land-grant universities to the point where now community colleges educate uh, over 40% of Americans in this country. And online universities are now disrupting them, and our state universities are feeling that pain quite acutely as of late. Um, and that, that truly is a disruptive innovation. Now, what's interesting about this model is everyone says, well, we just have to grab onto the technology. If we just get the technology right, then we can grab hold of this, and we can really change the world. And it turns out it's actually not a technology problem. And for, just to demonstrate this, for this story, I want to go back to the 1950s and 60s when the dominant consumer electronic product of the time uh, were powered by vacuum tubes. For those of you that remember, vacuum tubes were about the size of your fist. Um, there's a guy who actually repairs them still in Redwood City, um, right? I swear, to, you can't make this stuff up. And, um, and, but because vacuum tubes, they would blow out every once in a while, and you'd have to get them to replace them. But they, enabled these unbelievable technological marvels of the time. Tabletop radios and floor standing televisions. And so um, companies like RCA and Zenith, right, made these and were the leading consumer electronics companies of the time. And an interesting thing happened in 1947 out of Bell Laboratories. Out of the research labs there, scientists invented what's become known as the transistor, the first foray into solid state electronics. And every vacuum tube company saw the transistor and said, this is a really exciting technology. They could see the potential. It's more durable, it's smaller, it enables some new things, but it wasn't good enough to handle the power that power-hungry devices needed at the time that the vacuum tubes were able to do. So they all took a license to it because they said, this thing is going to be something. And then they stuck it into their laboratories and started to do research and development on it. And they started spending lots of money to perfect it. And they basically framed it that if we can just make the, va uh, the transistor good enough, <clears throat> excuse me, then we'll just cram it in to that blue space there and swap it in for our vacuum tubes inside of our products. And the customers, they won't even know the difference. They'll just keep buying these products from us. The problem was that the vacuum tube was so good at powering these devices, it kept getting better and better and inching along. And that technological hurdle was so high that despite RCA investing over a billion dollars in research, they never got there, never made sense to swap it in. But the transistor has transformed our world and our lives, right? How did it happen? 
Well, the first application for the transistor came out in 1952 in this little thing called a hearing aid. This was a perfect place for the transistor to get its start because a vacuum tube was totally, <laughs> totally clunky. And the hearing aid required very little power and the transistor could handle very little power, so it turned out to be a marriage made in heaven. And then in 1955, this company no one had heard of out of Japan, and when they heard of them, they didn't think much of them, called Sony, came out with this thing, little thing called a pocket transistor radio. Now, pocket transistor radio, let me tell you, it was crummy. Fidelity wasn't near as good as those tabletop radios. Clay Christensen grew up in Utah. He had to face west if he wanted to get a signal. Um, and, but, but Sony had this insight which was, we're gonna send, sell this thing to the low end of humanity. People today we call teenagers. <laughs> and teenagers will be just delighted with this product because to them it won't seem crummy at all, right? Because it'll cost just a couple bucks, they can drop it in their shirt pocket, run out of earshot of their parents and listen to their rock and roll music. And this was an awesome device from their perspective and it got better and better. By 1959, Sony introduced uh, the portable television and, uh, you know, same thing, right? It wasn't nearly as good as the uh, vacuum tube fl uh, floor standing TVs, but they sold it to non consumers, people that had small pocketbooks or small apartments and couldn't afford a floor standing television. It got its foothold there and got better and better and better. And ultimately, it transformed the world as people rushed out into the transistor world as things got good enough, delighted with this more affordable, convenient product. And so transformation came to the industry. Now this is a particularly brutal story, right? Because RCA saw the transistor well before Sony did. They invested way more money than Sony ever did. But it wasn't a question of money or technology. It was a question of deploying the disruptive technology in the right model. And what I'd like you to take away from this is that the model ha matters whether it's the business model or how it's used, that matters a lot more than, does the, than do these other things. And so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and just go into one more theory, and you'll see why that's relevant as we come back to education in a moment. But just, just keep that in mind. Now, this last theory steals from the world of engineering, and it basically says that there's two types of system architectures in the world. They exist on a continuum, so don't think of this as an absolute. But on the one end is what we call an interdependent system architecture. It's proprietary. And, and the reason you have an interdependent architecture is the way that one part works and functions depends upon the way another part works and functions and vice versa. So it's interdependent, right? Um, and it, it, it enables some unbelievable performance. The, the trick with an interdependent architecture is that you can't just swap in another part because it screws up the way the entire uh, system works, right? And so as a result, well, I'll give you a quick example. Microsoft Windows is sitting up there. But Microsoft Windows is an intricately interdependent operating system, OK? And what that means is while it, it very much gives you some good performance in the early years of the operating system world in the personal computer realm, that interdependence means that if you were to go in there right now and just delete any old 10 lines of code, the whole system would crash. And not just because it's Microsoft, but <laughs> they're not sponsoring the conference, so I can say something. Um, but, but because those 10 lines of code interact in very interdependent ways with the rest of the code, right? And so if you wanted a customized version of Microsoft Windows, you'd literally have to go into the code base and redesign the entire thing, which means that for you to get a customized version would cost you in excess of $500 million. So while it does some good things, and interdependence is important in certain stages in an industry or a sector, customization is prohibitively expensive in this world. Now, contrast this with a modular open architecture. As the interfaces between different parts become more and more well understood, you can modularize things so that you can plug and play, mix and match best of breed components. And what modularity does is allow for very straightforward customization far more affordably. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, 
so the Dell personal, well, the Linux operating system is an open source operating system, right? It would be the counterpart uh, to the Microsoft Windows example. It, because in the open source, it has this strong kernel, and you can just go out and say, take this kernel from the open source here, I'll take this one here, don't need that. Voila, for a lot less money, you have a customized version of an operating system. Uh, the Dell personal computer is a lot easier for me to imagine. Uh, if, if, you, if you went back into the 1990s and looked at their Dell desktop computers um, and peeled the cover off those computers, what you would have noticed, and still would notice, is that Dell didn't make any of the parts inside the machine. Everything was, was from a different modular supplier. And what that enabled you to do was some pretty cool things. You could jump on the Dell website and just say, I'd like this type of drive from a Seagate, I'd like this type of memory, I'd like this type of monitor, this much RAM, on and on and on. And they would just mix and match best of breed components and ship you out a very affordable, customized computer within 24 to 48 hours, right? And so the takeaway here is that modularity allows for customization. So I want to do a full pivot now. And think about, as we move to education and, and, and thinking about students, and I want to start with something that we all know, which is that students have different learning needs at different times. This has been fairly obvious to educators for a long time, I would argue. It's been fairly obvious to parents who've had two kids playing on the ground and learning at different ways and rates and so forth. But academics, it took them a little while to catch up to the party, um, as is so often the case. But ultimately, this is what they've given us, which is a food fight of what are the right ways to think about these uh, differences that students have. Howard Gardner, right out of Harvard, pioneered this theory of multiple intelligences. A bunch of people pushed back and said learning styles. Now the research seems to suggest learning styles isn't the right way to think about this. You, you, get, you, get, the, you get the narrative, right? But the point of this is that we know every student has different learning needs at different times. What cognitive and neuroscientists do not disagree on is that we learn things at different paces. We have different aptitudes or working memory capacities. Um, and we also all bring to in a learning experience different amounts of knowledge, different levels of experience, and so forth. And so if you, if you grant all of that, what you would expect is that we would have an education system customized to those different learning needs, right? Now, to be fair, for a long time, this is what the education system has looked like like a factory, it was built to standardize uh, the way we teach and test. But to be fair, we weren't asking the education system to educate well every single child for the needs of the 21st century economy. We we're actually often asking it to sort and sift and so forth. But ultimately, now as we're asking the school system to do something very different, society has been, which is to educate every single child successfully give them 21st century skills to be successful in the workforce, in this knowledge economy, and so forth. That job mandates that we have to customize to every single child's different learning needs if they're to realize their most daring dreams and fulfill their human potential. The problem is, as, as it depicts up here, the school system was literally designed to mimic the factory model that was so dominant in the early 1900s, right? And so, as a result, it was intricately interdependent. In the book, Disrupting Class, we talk about four kinds of interdependencies. I, I, I won't go through them there, go through them now, but there's, the school system is laced with interdependencies, which results in extraordinary standardization in the way we teach and test. And that clashes directly with the need for customization. If you think about it, and, and, or, or you doubt me on this, just go back to your own education experience. Maybe you were in high school in the middle of geometry class, and you were in the middle of a three-week unit. What happened at the end of that three-week unit? Took a test, and you moved on, and got the results afterwards. Regardless of how you did, you kept moving on, right? Even if you hadn't fully mastered a concept, which would later prove pretty pivotal to your future learning, too bad, we moved on because the interdependency mandated it. There's, there's the converse of that, right? Which is that, say you were in the middle of the world history class, pretend it was a year-long requirement, and uh, you were able to master the material in just a couple months. 
You really, you, you had traveled the world maybe, who knows why. What happened? You had to sit in that class for the entire year, growing bored by, for what for you, were repeated explanations, right? And, and that interdependence really explains why this happens, and it plays out in some pretty pernicious ways. Special needs students, if you're a special educator, you know, it costs two to three times on average to customize an individualized learning plan for a special needs student because of these interdependencies in the system. And if there's a special needs educator here, you'd quickly rush up to me afterwards and say, Michael, it would actually cost far more than that to truly individualize a learning plan for what they actually need. It's just the limits of what the system can afford is what's happening, right? And so we see this, and the question is, how can we break out of this standardization and move to a customized system that can differentiate for each child's needs? And from our theory work, right, you'd have to shift from this interdependent system to a more modular one. And so now in our, in our, in our work, in, in the book Disrupting Class, we suggested that schools do lots of important jobs in the lives of, um, of, of students in the community and so forth. Only one of these is academic, okay? And we suggested that for the academic job, that if you could shift some of the instruction or some of the learning to the platform of online learning or computer and so forth, that's inherently modular, right? Michael Horn can have his path that he would learn physics at, and, um, and Clay Christensen could have an entirely different path and so forth, different paces and so forth. It's inherently modular. The struggle with this and the mystery was that computers have been around for three decades. We've been spending wildly on them in schools for the last couple decades, over that now, two and a half decades. When we wrote the book, by conservative estimate, well over $60 billion equipping schools with computers, and yet we hadn't seen that instructional change. And the reason was, we've done what every organization does when they see a potentially disruptive innovation, which is to cram the potentially disruptive innovation into the mainstream, into the blue space there. Cram it in to do what you're already doing a little bit better, but not to fundamentally transform the model itself. And so it adds cost, and it doesn't change the model from this monolithic, standardized one into a student-centric one that can personalize for different learning needs. And, and, and if, you know, you can see this, right? We've, we've shoved computers into the back of classrooms and said now you can do some PowerPoint or some word processing. We've put them in computer labs because it's kind of like pencil labs that we remember when we went to school. Um, and, but we've never fundamentally transformed um, the, the, the actual model itself. And if you look at it, you can actually see that a lot of the technologies that we've gotten excited about at various times have really just actually been sustaining innovations. It, you may know where I'm going with this, but the chalkboard here, then they introduced this cool thing called a whiteboard, and then people got you to spend a lot of dollars on a smart board that I'm sure every single teacher uses. <laughs> and there was all these other cool innovations in between that, that also sustain this trajectory of teach and deliver. Now, there's an irony of me t lecturing right now. I get it. But, um, <laughs> but bear with me, right? So, um, so, so some of you are getting this really rapidly and are, have already read the book, and this is really boring, and some of you are behind, and hopefully I'm teaching to the middle, which is mythical, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so he here we are, though. We see this playing itself out. So the question is, from our theories, is, well, there's actually a way to get around this mystery, which is all we have to do is target the disruptive innovation, at first in those areas of non-consumption, where we can actually reinvent the model itself, right? And we have the freedom to do that, such that we can actually change the instructional model, so we can make it this student-centric system and customize for these different learning needs. And that brought up another mystery, though, which was, where would these areas of non-consumption be? Right, because schooling is largely compulsory in the United States. And while we could go to developing countries and realize, holy cow, they're probably gonna leapfrog us just like they are right now with mobile payments and the like, because 70 million kids around the world do not have access to primary school and 200 million do not have access to secondary school. In the United States, what are we, wh where are we gonna go? It turns out we're, that we're not talking about disrupting schools. We're talking about disrupting class. And if you look at the course level, that there's lots of areas of non-consumption. 
Now, in the book, I think we talked about four or five. This is basically, this list has come about from traveling around over the last, gosh, four years almost, um, and people saying, you missed another one, you missed another one there, and so forth. So this is sort of what the list represents. But credit recovery is a huge area of non-consumption in our high schools. Right now, students fail a course, often have no way to make it up. Sometimes they just keep plowing through, and then they get to graduation, and people act shocked that they don't have the credits needed to graduate. Um, other times, we give them a summer school packet or something like that. Um, but it's not really a meaningful experience, and we've cut back summer school and so forth because of budget cuts. So it's a huge area of non-consumption where if we offer online learning and allow people to start there, they can start to make up their credits and so forth, learn at the path and pace that makes sense for them. They don't have to repeat the things that they already know and so forth and catch back up. Dropouts are another huge area. Superintendent talked about it before, but it's roughly 200,000 students, I think, did not graduate from California's high schools on time last year. Huge area of non-consumption where if we can put in different schooling models enabled by online learning, we can allow students to do the working needs that, that they need to attend to or whatever it might be and have flexible schedules and make it motivating so that they can get back involved. Um, AP courses, that's a fairly er uh, obvious area of non-consumption, but the story's much bleaker, right? So worldwide, excuse me, nationwide, 26% of American high school students attend a high school that does not offer an advanced course defined as anything above uh, geometry. So no algebra two, no trigonometry, forget about calculus. Uh, defined as anything above biology, so forget about chemistry, forget about physics. They weren't that important anyway. And defined as any honors English class period. Now in the state of California, as has become increasingly known, 50% of students attend a school that does not offer the full set of A through G courses needed to get into the higher education system here. Right? And so there's a ballot initiative that a lot of districts and counties have been working through in supporting the Student Bill of Rights initiative to help solve that problem. But it's a huge area of non-consumption where online learning can be a big part of the solution. This disproportionately affects small, rural, and urban schools. You, you can see I have a huge list up there that's emerged. I'm not going to go through them all. What's interesting is that the looming budget cuts and teacher shortages that we're all facing, they naturally, and the superintendent alluded to, alluded to it, they naturally seem like a threat. That's a very natural reaction. It's, it's every, every organization we've ever studied naturally sees it. But if you can get out of that crouch position and shift your vantage point to see, gee, you know, it's actually increasing these areas of non-consumption. Maybe it can be an opportunity to innovate. It's not easy to do, but that's how we have to view it because that's that opportunity to transform the system from the monolithic one we have today into that student-centric one. And that's the opportunity. Now, what's interesting is we see that online learning is actually falling into this trajectory um, as a disruptive innovation, hitting these areas of non-consumption and growing. Uh, and so it followed the pattern for many, uh, uh, many of the other sectors we, have, we had studied in the past. And so what we see is whenever disruptive innovation comes online, it follows this S-curve pattern. That is, in the early years, the disruption isn't actually that good. It's only serving limited few people, so it sort of creeps in there, right? People try it out. There's lots of feedback. At some point, it really starts to nail the jobs that people have to be done, and it rapidly increases, and then it levels off at the top. Disruptions always follow that S-curve pattern. The problem is, if you're on the early part of that S-curve, right over here, how do you know if an S-curve is actually developing? Maybe it's a straight line in nowhere, or it could be a really rapidly steep S-curve, or a slow-moving one. You just don't know. It turns out that there's a way to predict the flip, and if one's actually happening. And I won't go into the math, but basically, you put the uh, percent of the new divided by the percent of the old as a percent of market share, if you will, put it on a logarithmic axis. And if an S-curve is developing, it linearizes that S-curve such that the data points fall out on a straight line. So you can predict when, uh, when the new will hit 25%, 50%, and so forth. And what we've seen is that in online learning at the high school level, in terms of courses taken, an S-curve seemed to be developing when we wrote the book, such that we made this crazy prediction that by 2019, 50% of all high school courses would be delivered online in some form or fashion. 
Now, when we came out with the prediction in the first six months, everyone said, you guys are absolutely nuts. You're crazy. You're way too aggressive. Public education could never change that fast, and so forth. What happened after that six months, with the, when the financial crisis hit and so forth, was everyone came back to us and said, you're still crazy, but it's because you're too uh, conservative with your prediction. It's actually happening faster than you realize, and public schools are going to make this happen. I kind of plead the fifth on it. There's a bunch of data points that suggest, yeah, it's happening pretty fast. There's a lot of confusion over the numbers. Uh, Brian Bridges is here. I saw him earlier, probably tweeting. He's uh, with the California Learning Resource uh, Network, C-Learn, um, and they're doing a survey to actually figure out what the actual numbers um, are. So if you're in a district, go to that starting March 1st and actually talk about what type of online learning you have in your district so we can actually get a good picture on this and really figure out what's going on um, and how it's actually developing, because it's pretty important. Because ultimately, it's not the numbers that matter, per se. I kind of plead the fifth on whether we'll hit that or not. Because if we came back in, gosh, seven, eight years, and we'd hit roughly that prediction, plus or minus a few years, but the system looked relatively like the system we have today, I don't think any of us would feel terribly good about it. And so the key is to use this disruption as an opportunity to actually transform into that student-centric system. And so the question is, is this happening? And there's, there's, there's some positive signs, because online learning is inherently modular to some degree, right? It, it, it facilitates these different paths and paces, more on the paces today, less on the paths, unfortunately, but more on the paces today relatively easily. This is a screenshot from the Khan Academy. How many people are familiar with Khan Academy? Gosh, that would not have been the case two years ago, I'm guessing. Um, unbelievable. He gets 4 million hits to his website right a, a month now. Um, 4 million uniques, unique visitors, that is. Um, this is a, a shot from Los Altos Public Schools. People, anyone here from Los Altos or the county? You got a couple, I think. Um, so um, this is a screenshot from Khan Academy used in Los Altos that actually shows you the different paces of student learning broken down in the individual. Pretty, pretty fascinating that you can tease that apart. But the question is, so there's going to be some inherently modular um, piece of this that I think will result in some student-centric learning. The question is, will it result all the way? And there I think there's some questions. There's some positives and then there's some big question marks. The positives, I think, are that technology is predictably improving. Now, how many people, when I said online learning, your first reaction was distance learning? Just a gut reaction. You can be honest if you were. So that, uh, it's interesting. Almost no one raised their hand. So a year ago, that wouldn't have been the case, is my, is, is my guess. And it's because online learning, which started out as a distance learning phenomenon, is really starting to improve by snapping itself into brick and mortar environments. Because the reality, and our studies have shown this, is that at most 10% of kids, at most around the country, will be able to be uh, basically homeschooled in a full virtual school environment. Because the reality is, as they say, the problem with homeschooling is that it happens at home. And most parents are dual income parents, one parent households, uh, you need a custodial job, you don't have the expertise, whatever, kids actually, it turns out, like to have fun with other kids, whatever it is, right? There's a large percentage, of, there's a large reason that lots of people will still continue to go to school, and public schools at that. Um, but it's, so online learning is getting better by snapping itself into brick and mortar environments known as um, blended learning, which has become this big, uh, hot term right now, blended learning. And uh, so we did some research work on it in the last year and a half or so. And last January, out of the Insight Institute website, you can get it free there, we uh, released a couple reports, one in January, one in May, um, called the rise of K-12 blended learning, and a second one that profiled about 40 different schools doing blended learning around the country. And in that, we came out with this definition, which is any time a student is learning in part through online delivery with some element of student control over the time, the place, the path, and or the pace, that's really important for this, and at least in part in a supervised brick and mortar location away from home, generally school, right? This is what blended learning is. It's not our you know, preferred definition per se or anything like that. It's not good or bad, less expensive or more expensive or anything like that just sort of describing what we saw in the field and trying to define it in a common way. And um, 
This is sort of this is what we came out with. Now, importantly, this definition doesn't exclude some things, which we would call tech-rich schools. What we're not talking about is simply keeping the um, model the same and putting a smart board in front and beaming online curriculum at the students. <laughs> There's been no shift in the instructional model. The students don't have any control over time, place, path, or pace. Um, so what I'm doing right now is not blended learning. Um, we're not talking about simply putting one-to-one -one laptops or digital textbooks in and of themselves. Those things may be enablers of blended learning, but they're not, A, required to do it, and they're not sufficient to do blended learning because they don't naturally change that instructional model. And so that's, that's where we came out with the definition. And what we've seen is that there's several different models of blended learning emerging. And so I thought I would talk through some of this um, part of the research uh, that we see emerging from the field just to give you an idea of what we're seeing. And, and, and our gut is that this will continue to change. When we first came out with the report, we had six different models of blended learning. We now think it's more like four based on a lot of feedback that the field has given us and so forth. And we welcome you to come to our website, email us, say us, you know, you screwed up this way because as a bunch of people in this audience can attest to, we, we do really try to respond to that feedback and try to improve these categories. I also think these won't be fixed for another reason, which is the pace of innovation right now out there is so rapid that I think in another year's time, we'll have far more granularity that allows us to change these even further, and I hope that's the case. So this is sort of the state of where it is right now, but don't let it put you in the box uh, of the four walls of the classroom, um, uh, literally. So the rotation model um, we're seeing in a lot of places right now, and, and basically this is where you're in, within a given course, the students rotate from the online activity to other activities or activity on a fixed basis within a given course. So within math, you're doing part online and then part with the face-to-face -face teacher and so forth on a very fixed schedule. And we're seeing different types of rotation models abound. Um, station rotation perhaps is the most familiar one. In elementary schools, we already have station classrooms in many cases, so it's actually pretty easy to make one of them an online learning one, and as long as it informs the um, uh, pace or the path or something like that that occurs in the other stations, that's a station blend, uh, a station rotation. The lab rotation um, has been made popularized by the uh, charter school rocket ship uh, education out of San Jose, California. They're doing a lab rotation where for, you know, they're learning in math or re uh, language arts inside of the classroom and then they rotate to a learning lab where they're doing some online learning. The individual rotation, uh, Carpe Diem is a charter school out of Arizona that I highly recommend taking a look at. Um, this is, it's similar to the other rotations where you rotate on a fixed basis, but students actually don't always rotate to every single activity. They have an individual playlist that tells them where to rotate based on their individual needs, that the teacher or the software or some collaboration of the two sort of come out with, for the student. And then there's the flipped classroom, which is sort of the ubiquitous thing that uh, Sal Khan uh, loves to talk about quite a bit. Um, the flex model is a really interesting one. <clears throat> it's, it's a cousin of the rotation model, but it comes at it from the other perspective, which is that the online platform is really where you start with, and you basically have face-to-face -face support and very fluid schedules based on student needs. You don't rotate on a fixed basis. It's entirely individualized for that child, such that it's a flex model. The self-blend is what I think of as the ubiquitous form of online, excuse me, of blended learning across the country, that I'm guessing the majority of districts uh, do in California, and certainly do across the country. This is where students are attending physical school, traditional school, and taking one, two, three, whatever online courses. From the perspective of the school, you may not have thought you were doing a blended learning thing, but from the perspective of the student, of course, that's blended learning, right? There's some online and there's uh, some traditional. Whether that occurs in a computer lab, a library, or at home, doesn't, doesn't seem particularly salient. And then the last kind is what we're calling, we've had like five different names for this one. We're now calling it enhanced virtual. Um, basically, it's kind of like a virtual school, but you're, um, you're, you're having students check in in a physical school at fixed times throughout the week uh, and so forth to get face-to-face -face support. These are the models we're seeing right now. Take it for what it's worth. The, um, 
Second way we see that technology is really improving is that the um, communication vehicles underlying it are getting a lot better. Um, this is a, just a screenshot of a virtual classroom that allows students to collaborate with students and teachers with teachers and teachers with students and all sorts of things around the world. But um, how many people in here use Skype? Almost everyone. I, I want you to think back um, just five, six, seven years ago. I, generously, um, you know, it wasn't revealed that I w worked at AOL briefly. But um, but you remember AOL with the IMs and, and trying to do video chat on, on that? And how it, it, you'd get it up for about 10 seconds and then the thing would fizzle and you'd just get frustrated? And now think with Skype and so forth, how we just take video chat from almost anyone around the world. It's effortless, right? The improvement of communication technologies has been just extraordinary. And the path that that's going to take over the next 10 years, I think, is something that we can't even imagine to connect people to, uh, with each other and allow for collaborations we can't even imagine with 3D screens and touch screens and so forth coming online. Who knows what this is going to look like? The third way we're seeing some pretty dramatic improvements is finally that the content itself is starting to improve. If you went back some 20 years ago, 1989, and looked at the University of Phoenix's first online courses, they were kind of like a correspondence course put online. And then if you went into the 1990s and the majority of the 2000s, the online courses kind of looked like my PowerPoint. Boring, flat, sequential, and a lot of multiple choice. But we're starting to see some turn in the content itself, which is enabling some pretty robust, engaging environments. And I think this is critical to creating a student-centric system, because ultimately, we have to make this intrinsically motivating, such that students are captivated and want to do this in the face of everything else that they could be doing. Um, and this is a screenshot from the first video game-based uh, online learning course that the Florida Virtual School, the state-run school out of Florida, debuted um, in, uh, a, a couple years ago. It's called Conspiracy Code. They have a history version of it and a literacy version. In the history version of it, students run uh, 10 missions to save American history from becoming corrupted. Yeah, are, some of you are already joking it's too late. But um, <laughs> apologies. But, uh, the, uh, but, but for many students, this is a deeply motivating way for them to learn American history. And what's important is that it didn't work in the research for every single child. And that's the point. We have to get out of this one-size-fits-all mentality. For those students for whom it's motivating and works, great. And we need other pathways for other students. That's exactly the point. Um, now, just just give you an idea of the array of content that's going on. This is from our report that came out in May on the rise of blended learning. It gives a feel for how many content options are out there. This was just from the 40 schools, the different contents, uh, content providers that were being used. There is a robust marketplace out there of options that you can choose from, mix and match, and so forth. And there's providers coming on to help you mix and match it, and so forth. There's a lot of choices that there weren't 15 years ago. Um, we actually did an education tech map that I thought I'd share briefly with New Schools Venture Fund and Education Elements, which is a, a company in the space of blended learning, um, where we sort of decided, you know, we'll take a snapshot in time of what the ed tech world looks like right now knowing full well that as soon as we pushed it out, it would be outdated um, because of the pace of innovation. But we divided the world into four categories. Curricula, um, instructional systems, um, you have your data systems there, and your talent management systems. Um, and this is what the ed tech market map looks like. I'll, I'll go into the categories in a second so you can see it. You can get it off the New Schools Venture Fund website for free. It's all there. And you can click on each dot and see the product and the company and so forth. Um, it's all free, just to give you an idea of the universe of things that are coming online that are out there. Some of these are pretty crummy, but some of these are really innovating pretty rapidly, and it's pretty interesting to watch as some of these adaptive systems and game-based systems and social learning systems and so forth start to come on. Um, and so this just quickly uh, breaks down the different categories that we try to capture. Um, you have online courses. You have uh, online games um, for learning. You have intervention core products, by which we meant um, really things targeted at reading and math. Um, specialized, on the other hand, specialized core on the actual map, referred to things 
um, that were science or behavioral or uh, for, for ELL or whatever else like that, other categories. Um, online instruction meant that there was teachers provided and platforms and so forth. Test prep is fairly obvious. Um, you've got tutoring solutions, digital textbooks. Um, in the instructional systems, you have all sorts of things for teachers, social learning systems, learning management systems, collaboration tools, communication assessment systems. Data systems, you've got a data warehouse, things reporting, student information systems. In talent management, you have professional development systems, which are pretty exciting for teachers and the non-consumption that that um, uh, holds in store observation tools and HR systems. Lots of technologies coming online um, that can help you start to put together these experiences for students. What I'd encourage you again is just to remember as you do so, it's not about the technology, right? And we should never be trapped into the technology for technology's sake. I, you know, the number of schools that will come to me and say we have the smart boards or now it's we have the iPads. It's not the point, right? It's the model in which it's used and so forth. And so just to some practical implications as you dive into this work, and I, th I thought I'd leave it through these couple slides um, and leave it here. The first one is certainly feel free to begin at the end. Define the vision. Define what looks like success. What are the outcomes you want to see? And then work backwards. It's always going to be an iterative process, right? You're never going to get there from the first day, and that's OK. And so enter that design process with that humility and knowing that. Um, and then make technology the slave to your strategy, not the other way around. And, and, and don't be afraid if you're working with a vendor to say, hey, this sucks. <laughs> like, this is what I need and I'm the consumer. Because ultimately the consumer, the customer is always right. Don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to say that. Um, harness that power of time, place, path, and pace for student personalization. Come back to that um, in a second, but really don't be afraid to personalize for your circumstance too. Think of terms SWOT, meaning the strategies, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats, and really build something that makes sense for your personal circumstances. What one district is going to do is not going to be the solution another district should do, and it never should be. Um, you can, you, you've seen these other things. I'll, I'll shift into that last one, which is focus really on the outcomes. Be less concerned with how you get there in terms of measuring. Now, obviously, as you're constructing it, you'll have to be very concerned with how you get there. But ultimately, keep the end in mind, is what I'd say. And don't be beholden by the old metrics that we use to judge the old system. If you did that, the personal computer never would have gotten started against the mini computer, right? The smartphone would never have been born, because we would have always said, well, how are we supposed to use the screen or type? So don't be afraid to redefine it by its new metrics that make sense for it. And in general, move beyond the focus on inputs and processes and much more to outcomes and what we want to see. I'll talk about that in a second. The self-sustaining funding is really what this ballot initiative is trying to do for this, such that there's a way for small districts or large districts to really accommodate student needs and provide a full menu of courses and customize um, for them. And that's really what the Student Bill of Rights is trying to do by creating the self-sustaining funding formula that wouldn't have any additional cost to the state. Now, skip into the um, human resource pipeline and professional development, because my gut is, now there's some people who say, hey, this is gonna replace teachers or something like that. It's not. It's not at all. But what I think for it to be successful, it will do, is it will change the jobs that teachers do. Right, in some pretty interesting ways. You heard it referenced earlier. The sage on the stage, the Michael Horn, Horn lecture model, is probably going to fade away if we do this right. Teachers are going to have a flowering of jobs to do. And my suspicion, I don't know for sure, but my suspicion is that there will actually be multiple jobs. Some will be the mentors, the motivators, the guide on the side, that person that's really the instructional designer right in hand with the student. There'll be some content experts. They may live in the school. They may live virtually. There'll be some people who act as caseworkers, I think significantly more, who are handling all the non-academic things that get in the way of academic learning. Far more budget, hopefully, for that, because it'll be freed up for that. And I wouldn't be surprised if you had teachers really working with teams and getting into some team teaching models 
and so forth as we break down the four walls of the classroom. But that's going to require very different professional development and human resources and so forth. And so one of the areas of non-consumption is actually professional development that I'd encourage you to think about. Right now, PD happens two to four times a year or so, and someone like me comes in and drones on something not particularly relevant to what students on the ground, excuse me, teachers are actually having to deal with on their day-to-day -day classrooms. So they sit there grading homework in the back, can't wait till the professional day is over, right? But the reality is that there's non-consumption of professional development all the time, every single day, and teachers have just-in-time problems that they need help solving all of the time. And so to use the online technology to be able to introduce those sorts of problem-solving things, I think is a hugely important way to A, better allocate PD dollars, make it more affordable, and actually help your teachers where they are. Um, we could go through these for a little bit longer. I just want to talk about one more, which is sort of drives off this treatment and use of data and this notion of changing the time, place, path, and pace for students and really breaking out of this model. And you'll hear more about this tomorrow. Susan Patrick, I know, is giving um, a session on, on, on moving this in the morning. Um, but I really wanted to talk about getting out of the system right now where time is very fixed and the learning is highly variable, right? And, and moving to a competency-based learning system that flips that on its head. So the factory-based model system today, we deliver content to students. You've already gone through this, right, with me. We uh, test and assess to see how you did. We move you on to the next unit. And then um, we uh, give you your progress ex post facto, but it's too late, you've moved on. And so as a result, right, the time is very variable, excuse me, the time is very fixed, but the learning is very variable. Instead, what we really need to do is shift to this competency-based learning system, where time becomes the variable so that learning can become the constant and that students progress when they've actually made, uh, made mastery. Instead of deliver content to students, this really should be have learning experiences and opportunities for students, but bear with me on the slide. Um, we would test and assess still. Testing and assessment is absolutely important. It gives us lots of good feedback and data. But now we would use it to receive real-time and interactive feedback and drive back into the learning moment so that we can have this loop that's constantly going. There's lots of research that says feedback is really important if the student can do something about it. If you just give feedback and don't allow the student to change the work or do something about it, feedback is actually an incredibly negative thing in the cognitive and neuroscience research. And you can see why. It's incredibly demotivating, right? We all want to be successful in our lives and our jobs and so forth. And after you've actually made mastery, then you can progress on to the next grade, subject, body of material, material and so forth. I think this is absolutely critical to enabling that student-centric environment such that we can see that vision of disrupting class and really driving into the future of learning such that we can serve every single child well. I know that the entrepreneurial spirit in this room can do it. I know that the entrepreneurial spirit of California can do it. And I know that we can all drive forward and we have several days over the ne in this week in these beautiful climates to think about how to do it, even in these troubling times, that actually can be an opportunity. I have all the faith in the world in our educators and our public schools. And I thank you for the opportunity to be with you this afternoon.